I wanted to start off this morning with kind of a hypothetical question for y'all. Uh, something that uh, I want you to consider um, uh, and, and think about. What if you knew that this was the last time you were going to get to talk to somebody? You know, Bruce kind of brought that up about uh, whether they were the, the, the folks that, that died in 9-11, if they were ready for that. But think about the, if this was the last conversation you were going to have with somebody that you care about, that you love. What would you say to them? Think about what you would what you would do. I mean, would you tell a knock knock joke or talk about the weather, or would you want to make sure that it's kind of important, right? Um, you you want to make sure that one of the last things you say. You want one of those mic drop moments where you say something. You ever seen in the movies where they like their last words echo in the heads of our and the hearts of your hero on into the future and comes back at a special time in, in their life and they use those words. Don't you want to go out on that note? Like, go out with something awesome. Or if you're a little off like me, you want to say something that makes no sense and then torture them the rest of their lives. Like, like I, I can look at, it always is what it never was. <laughs> like, they're like, what is he talking about? I don't understand. No, I really wouldn't do that. But, well, actually, I might. I, might, I don't know. But everybody else would want to make sure that it counts, right? You want to make sure that your last words with, with the people you love, the people you care about, count. Uh, and so I want you to keep that in mind as we jump into Matthew 28 today. Let me tell you what's going on here. This is after the resurrection. All right, Jesus has died on the cross. Three days later, they find an empty tomb. Whoops, that didn't go as, as everybody planned. And, and, and so uh, Jesus' followers, his best friends, are kind of freaking out a little bit. Uh, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And Jesus makes a handful of appearances to them after the resurrection before he goes up uh, and, and is sitting at the right hand of God where he is now, right? And so, so he comes and he says a couple things to them, and you can bet that they're probably important. And so I want to jump in today, uh, Matthew 28, starting with verse 18. Read along with me if you have a Bible. Uh, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'll stop there for a second because you notice that he sort of set his disciples up a little bit. He sort of prefaced what he's talking about. He's saying, uh, I've been given all the authority. I'm kind of a big deal now, right? Because uh, they were trying to figure out, was he just a carpenter that's really good at teaching was he a, real, a magician that could do these miracles? And he reminds them, hey, this is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords talking to you right now. All right? So he's just, and he's like, that being said, therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, which was kind of big because back in that, those times, they were just worried about the, the Israelites. But he's saying, no, the whole world has a chance to be a part of God's family. Right? And so he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on to say this. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even until the end of an age. Love that. You may have heard that uh, if you've come up in church any. Uh, they, they call it the Great Commission. Um, and it is a foundational part of who we are as believers. And so this morning I, I felt led, uh, and I re as I was going through, by the way, y'all pray for me because I was looking at this going, man, I could do like three or four sermons out of this. Like this is, but you know, I only get up here every once in a while, right? Randy only calls me out to the big leagues, you know, every once in a while. So got to make it count. Um, but I, uh, I, I, even if you're not a believer here this morning, if you're going, well, I don't know about this thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not against church, but I don't really... I don't understand, and I don't know if this Jesus guy is worth following. Uh, I think this is good that you know this, because this is a big part of who we are as Christians. But even us Christians, we sometimes forget about this. Uh, and so I want to talk uh, a little bit about what the Great Commission means. Uh, and, but first, you may, there, just reading this, there may be a couple questions I want to make sure we're on the same page on. And the first is, what is a disciple, right? And a disciple is someone who obeys and follows Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a pretty simple definition because people don't use the word disciple anymore. They, they, but, but a disciple is someone who obeys and follows Jesus Christ. Now, just because you're sitting in a seat this morning doesn't make you a disciple. Just because you've got a spiffy thank you Jesus sign in your yard doesn't necessarily make you a disciple. Hey, great, love it, but that doesn't make you a disciple. In fact, John 8, 31 says, You are truly my disciple if you remain faithful to my teachings. 
right? So showing up, having the right answer, that doesn't make you a disciple. But if you have had that moment that Bruce was talking about, where, you're e- where your eternity is secure, where you've said, you know what? I realize I'm a sinner, that I need Jesus to save me from those sins so that I can have a relationship with God, uh, and, and changed your mind, and then said, you know what, Jesus, you're the boss. I'm going to do what you say. That, it, that is what a disciple is. But you may also be thinking, how do I make a disciple? Right? Like, is there a Lego set involved that I get to follow the directions on? Or how do I make a disciple? Well, you make a disciple by teaching, leading, and encouraging someone to grow close to God. And, and that could be all kinds of things. But the, ba- the basic point of that is you're pushing them closer to God in whatever way that you can. Um, and I know what you're probably thinking is, wait, isn't that your job? Like, isn't, isn't that ball guy, that's why we pay for him, right? So that, the, the, that he can do that for us and we can show up and, and take it all in. No, the, this is not just for church leaders. This is for everybody. We are all called to make disciples. And, and some of you are going, ah, I don't know if I can do that. Well, look at what 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says. This is the easiest way to do it. Follow me as I follow Christ. That is making a disciple in its simplest terms. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't know, have to be a great communicator necessarily. You just have to invite someone to follow you as you follow Christ. That's what making a disciple is all about. And I think that uh, as we, we read that, that passage, I picked out a couple things I think is important for us to understand this morning about making disciples. And the first thing is that making disciples, that's essential. Essential, just a fancy word for do it right? It's important. It's mandatory. This is not the only spot that we hear about this. Mark 16, 15 says, and then Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. In Luke 24, 47, it says, it was also written that the gospel would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, right? God's telling us to do it. But somehow, we don't always treat that great commission, that commandment of God, the same way as we do others, do we? I've noticed, uh, as, as I've been working with Christians and noticing Christians, there's certain things that y'all are dead set on. There's some of y'all that read in the Bible where it says, don't get drunk. And you're like, you know what? I am so zealous about this. I am so dead set on this that I'm not even going to drink at all, right? And by the way, if that's what you need to do to obey God, more power to you. But realize that you, you're, you're going a little bit farther than maybe I would. I think I can drink and not get drunk. But if you can't, great. But you're very zealous about that. Some of you I've talked to that you don't even really date, right? You're praying a lot, Lord, send me somebody, but you're not actively out there dating around because you know your heart, and you know that you may end up sinning sexually if you do that, and so you're just going to avoid it at all costs. You're very serious about that. The Bible says, have a Sabbath, keep it holy, so y'all don't do nothing on Sundays, all right? You're like, I'm going to make sure, no, I'm not answering the phone, not doing anything, you're going to do nothing. Y'all are zealous about that, but yet... When God says, go and make disciples, you're like, well, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe later, right? And so we need to be reminded that this is the great commission, not the great suggestion. This is not Jesus going, hey, listen, guys, um, if you get around to it, I'm just going to float this out there. Uh, and if you, if you like it, go for it. If not, send it right back to me. It's all good. Listen, do you mind making disciples? Like, could you fit that into your schedule? He doesn't say it like that. He commands us, go make disciples. If you have a Bible that's yours, underline go. That denotes action. That means you have to get up off your butt and go do something. And for whatever reason, Christians think that we can show up to church and not make disciples, and and God's happy with us. Hey, if we just show up, we're doing good. Um, But let me just tell you this. If you do nothing else... If you're a Christian here and you, uh, if you want to do one thing right, make disciples, right? We, we talk, if, if I had to boil down our, somebody saying, hey, all right, Ben, what, what's, it, what's the Christian life like? What's the most important things? Love God, love others, make disciples. Simple, right? And by the way, you can't really love God and love others unless you're making disciples because loving God and loving others causes you to make disciples. And so if you do nothing else, If we are not as successful as a church at anything else, we need to be successful at making disciples. And so if you agree, if you think, I've tried to give you plenty of scripture here, you know I'm not just making this up, then you may be wondering, who do I disciple? And so short answer, fat people. You disciple fat people. You're like, hey, Ben's been discipled a lot lately. Um, Fat does not actually mean fat. It means faithful, available, 
teachable, right? Uh, I heard a pastor use that, and I was like, oh, i got to use that. That's good. Faithful, available. When you're looking for someone to disciple, they got to be faithful. they got to be available. they got to be teachable. Teachable. Uh, God, he, or Jesus, when he was trying to convince his followers to follow him, they were fishermen, right? Like, I, by the way, I hope that encourages you about uh, Jesus' uh, 12 disciples. They were kind of roughnecks. They, they, were, they, were, they were fishermen, right? And so Jesus talked in a way that he, they could understand. He said, listen, uh, you're fishing for fish now. I want to make you fishers of men. So if we're going to be fishers of men, if we're going to make disciples, you've got to put some lines in the water. And people have to nibble on the line, right? They have to, you have to get a bite back. And they, they won't all bite, but you've got to put plenty of lines in the water to make that happen. Um, and so today I wanted to lay out a couple areas because I, I really, I, I would hate to ever get up here and talk to you for uh, X amount of time and then you, ha- you to be able to take nothing to it into the week. And so uh, if you were to come out of here today and say, all right, how do I make disciples tomorrow, this afternoon? What do I need to do? A couple things. First, you need to go to your family. If you're going to go, start with your family. Your family is your, is your first mission field. I know you think that you were put there on accident. Like, these people are crazy. God, are you sure that you didn't, like, switch me in the hospital or something? But no, God has put you in that family to make disciples of your family, right? And that's the first things first. And I have to be reminded of that. God reminds me of that a lot because uh, uh, the devil will tempt me to be discouraged about youth ministry, because I've noticed over the past six years, my time spent with one-on-one with teenagers has gone down some, right? Like I used to be able to go pick them up and go get a milkshake, talk about life, go to more of their ball games and stuff like that. And, and I was really invested in, in discipling them uh, in, a, in a real and, and, and just kind of casual way, but a way that helps them know that I care about them. And, and every once in a while I go, man, I don't get to do that anymore. But you see, well, something happened six years ago. Uh, her name was Emma Suggs, and then came Addie, and then came Noah, and I realized that, that i got to spend more time discipling people with the last name of Suggs than I do non suggs right? And so my first priority is to, is to Proverbs 22, 6, my kids, and train them up in the way they should go, right? And let me just say to the parents here, I can't understate how important that is. That is so important, and I, it, it makes me sad to see so many parents over the, the last seven, eight years of youth ministry try to farm that out to me, try to farm that out to Pastor Randy, try to, try to let them figure that. I don't want to influence them. I just want them to figure it out on their own. No, don't do that. The numbers speak. I was reading a study this week. 82% of the uh, kids that are raised by parents that actively try to disciple them, to try to make them disciples, they continue in that faith. Only 1% do that when their parents don't do that. It is so important to disciple your kids. I would love for my job as a youth pastor to be irrelevant. Listen, I can find something else to do. I can can sweep the floors. I can do something else. I don't have to. but, But it's your job as a parent to make sure that you are making disciples out of your children. Husbands, you need to make disciples out of your wives. You need to make sure that you are pushing them closer to God. By the way, it's not just a parent's thing. If, you have an old, if you're an older brother or sister, you have enormous influence, right? Can you think of all the times that you have talked to your little brother or sister into doing something you knew they'd get in trouble for? Like, come here, look, try this out. Yeah, mama says it's fine if you jump off the roof. Try that out. Yeah, yeah, they, you can jump that tricycle off the side. The, no, the deck's fine. It's not that high. You have tremendous sway over your siblings. Why not, instead of teaching them how to cuss, why don't you teach them how to follow Jesus, right? How about you disciple your little brothers and sisters? Because God puts you in that family on purpose. But also, um, well, well, first I have to warn you, I guess, before we move on, because uh, this is the most, this is, the, this is hard, because they get to see all of you. I'm convinced this is why we don't disciple our family, because they get to see us first thing in the morning when we're grumpy, and when we're tired and want to go to bed, and when we've had a bad week, and when we got caught up in something that we shouldn't have been a part of. Look, I only have to be on for an hour or two a week to be, your, you know, your youth pastor. Then you think I'm doing great. They don't get to see me at 11 o'clock after working all day. And, and Jenna does. Pray for her. But it's hard because they get, to see you, they get to see all of you. That's why it's so important for you to be the same person on Sunday that you are the rest of the week. Your family's got great bull detectors when it comes to figuring you out and if you're one way on sunday and not that same way on monday 
then your witness is shot. No wonder they don't want to listen to you when you tell them the Bible says this, God says this. So uh, you have to go to your family, but also, all right, so here's your family. You go there first, but then you go out and you go to your neighbors, right? And I do mean your neighbors' neighbors, uh, but I also mean the people you work with. I also mean the people you're in school with, your classmates, your social group, your friends. The second step is to go to your neighbors, right? And even if you're not a believer, you probably heard, oh, well, Christians are supposed to love your neighbor, right? Mark 12 is love your neighbor. But look at what John 13, 35 says. It says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. You have to start loving your neighbors so that you can disciple them. It starts with that. Uh, in fact, Jeremiah 29, 7 says this, work for the peace and the prosperity of the city that I sent you. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. God had sent his people into exile to a bunch of heathens that didn't love God, didn't want to honor God. And he said, pray for them. He said, seek the peace and prosperity of that city. So you need to be seeking the peace and prosperity of Liberty, of Ramsar, of Siler City, of Julian, of, of Ashburg, of wherever you're from. Because God has sent you there like a holy insurgent behind enemy lines to make disciples. And so I wonder if we stopped comparing ourselves to our neighbors. What if we stopped uh, trying to one-up our neighbors and judge our neighbors for what time they got in last night or whether their car was there on Sunday morning or not? And what if we stopped trying to do that and we started just trying to have relationships with them that are God-centered, that are life-giving, that push them purposefully towards God? Imagine what you could do. By the way, I know I've, I've failed at this. I, I, every time I walk around my neighborhood, I realize how many of my neighbors I have no clue who they are. We've been living there five, six years now. And some of them I've tried, some of them I just, I'm like, man, I'm not even discipling my own neighborhood. We've got to start there. We've got to start somewhere. But also, you need to go where God leads. Right? Not everybody is going to be called up out of your home, out of your job, to go do something crazy for God somewhere you've never been before. But God can and he will send you somewhere that you never thought you'd go. Uh, I hate to break it to you, Liberty was not on my 10-year plan coming out of college. Right? I mean, I, this was a town that I blew through to get to Greensboro, right? Like, I, I don't, Liberty? I, I want to go to Liberty. But God called us to come to Liberty. And we, you go where God calls you. And, in fact, we've had a great example of that today. And, and Aaron, come on back up here. I want, I want Aaron uh, to come tell you about how, for the past couple of years, he ain't been in Sanford, right? He came up in Sanford. I met him in Sanford. He had less hair. No, he had more hair. I had less Right, right, yeah, I think I took his hair and put it on my face. But, um, but I, I wanted Aaron to, to take a minute and just share with you about some of the things God's done uh, sending him to Kosovo. Yeah, I'm Got to turn it on. Yeah. There it is. Okay. Um, before I do that, I, just, I get a question all the time is why? Why to go to somewhere else in the world when your family is not saved yet or you can disciple your neighborhood? Those are important. You should do that. But... Um, there's 2.8 billion people in the world today that have never even heard of the name Jesus Christ, never even heard that name. And put that in perspective for you, there's more people that have drank Coca-Cola than have heard Jesus mm -hmm. in the world. And so these are the kind of things that I started to hear about and God was stirring in my heart that caused me to want to go. And um, I was 21 year, years old when that happened. I had no Bible degree. Um, I never preached a sermon anywhere. Never even went on a mission trip outside of America. Never been outside of America before. But I just felt that call to go, and I knew that that's what I needed to do. So I just ask you to be involved um, with God. <laughs> be with God personally. Uh, it was just reading the scriptures and praying that caused me to get to that level. And, uh, and I didn't know, I didn't feel worthy to go. I didn't feel like equipped to go, but I just went, and God uh, empowered me to do it. And I don't regret it at all been in Kosovo four and a half years. Um, if you don't know, it's a Muslim country. There's around two million people who live there, and there's only 2,000 evangelical Christians. And uh, so that's 0.001% of the country. I, I live in a very lost um, place. I've been to people's houses giving New Testaments, and I've had them ask, uh, I've met people that never heard of Jesus. They had no idea what a Bible was, who Jesus was. I even used the Muslim words um, to try to help them, and they still didn't even know. And they, in Islamic faith, they believe in Jesus as a prophet. They still had no idea. So the need is very real. 
And so I always encourage people to, if you're not a goer, be a sender. You can um, support financially missionaries. You can pray for missionaries. And that's very much needed. And just do all the work you can in your own community, and God will be faithful. If you don't feel equipped, it's okay. God is the one that works. It's not myself. It's not my words. Um, it's God working in and through me. So I just encourage you to do that. And, um, yeah, thanks for giving me the chance to share with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah, he, <laughs> one of the things that, because I asked him that question, too, is like, dude, there's, there's work to do in Sanford. He's like, I know, but this is where God's telling me to go. There's people that are discipling in Sanford. I, I know his family. There's, they're disciples of Jesus. And so sometimes God will call you somewhere you never thought that you would go. But here's a, here's a little tip for you. Take the opportunities you're given. God opened the door for Aaron to go to Kosovo. He's opened doors since then. Uh, God is pretty good at getting you where you need to go if that's where he wants you to be. Right? And so we don't want to force it. That's the thing is, 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 is we don't want to try to, to tell God where he's going to send us. Um, I, I, I remember uh, growing up, uh, my grandmother, she always wanted so bad to be an overseas missionary. She, she was a nurse, and she, and, and she would just love the idea of going overseas, of uh, helping people medically, but also giving them healing spiritually. And she, you could tell just from talking to her, she wanted so bad to go overseas. And one day I was a teenager, started thinking, logically, I was like, well, why didn't you go? If you wanted to go, why didn't you go? And she's like, God never opened the door. God never gave me the opportunity. Even though she wanted to go so bad, God said, that's not my plan for you. And so guess what? She didn't give up. She made disciples in Greensboro. She made disciples in the Suggs family. She, she went where God led uh, and, and was obedient. And so uh, we've, we've got to just be uh, willing to go and, and realize the importance of that. But number two, uh, we've got to realize that making disciples, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, verse 19, he goes on to say, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Listen, it would be great if he just said, listen, this is all you got to do, guys. Go in, give a good speech, make them cry, uh, get them saved. Hey, say this prayer, dunk them in the water on the way out. Maybe do a water slide thing where you just kind of swish, swish, by Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, swish, put a notch in your belt and head on out of town, right? That would be great, but that's not how God wants us to do it. Right, God's called us to not only after we we make him a convert. People, I think, confuse convert and disciple. Right, once we get them saved, we've got to actually be a part of their lives. I mean, th think about that. What it takes, you've got to know the Bible. You got to know God. You got to be a part, like Aaron said, engaging in a relationship with God yourself, and then you have to know them, that person that you're making a disciple, well enough to make those two things meet. And, and, and do it for the betterment of their life. And so um, there's a couple facts I need to share with you, though, about this, this long process of making disciples. I feel like I need to, to, to make sure you know before you jump in, which is, number one, it's painful. I, I, I never thought it would be, but it, it's painful. It's painful in a good way. It's painful in a bad way, right? I, 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 it's a new type of hurt when the, you invest in somebody you guide somebody, you pray for someone for years, and then they turn their back. feels like they stabbed you in the back. That's one of the hardest parts of being a youth pastor is I, I, I try to help and try to, try to throw so much into them, and then they're like, well, God's really not real. Well, God really didn't say that. Well, I'm going to live this way. That's a, that's a new and different type of hurt. But that's what, when you, make some, when you make a disciple, you open yourself up to be wounded, which is why a lot of people don't do that because we don't like that. It's painful, but also it's even painful when it goes right. Look at uh, Acts 21.1. Listen to the emotion behind that. The apostles tore ourselves away from the church. If you read through the New Testament, they're like, I can't wait to see you again. I can't, man, I, I really wish we could stay, but God's telling me to go. I miss you. I pray for you. I, uh, they would sob and hug each other as they went on to the next town, right? Y'all, so, Some people... Unfortunately, sob with happiness because they get to leave the church Ooh, until next week, right? But do you hear how painful it is because they were close, they loved each other, but they knew that they had to go make disciples. Do you think it's it's fun when to not be able to see Don and Tabitha and Elijah and the rest of the Ramsor crew? You think we would naturally want to send them out? I mean, it's just Ramsor; we can still see them, but it's already bad enough that we don't get to see them on Sundays. It's not fun. 
I remember the the a couple it was about a year ago when we first started letting it be known that that we're Don and Tabitha were going to plant Ramsar and Jen and I were going to plant a Freedom Family Church Siler City and we kind of let it leak to the to the faithful to the core people that came and 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 y'all weren't sure what to think of that they're like no rest in peace Freedom Family Church is never going to be the same again. Well, there was, there was a certain Doc Kimry that uh, once she made the correlation between FFC Styler City and how much suglet time she gets, she's ready to cut somebody. She's like, don't you take them youngins from me, right? I was like, it's Sunday, all right, you get them on Monday, it's cool. But, but it's painful. But we have to realize that God still wants us to do it. And in fact, that leads to the second fact that it takes sacrifice. It's going to take some sacrifice to make disciples, full disclosure. You're not going to get to do whatever you want whenever you want to do it. It blows me away the things I spend money on, the things I spend time on, uh, the, the, the priorities I have in my life just because I know that I have to make disciples. It's much easier to save that money. I don't really feel like taking them out to, to lunch today. I don't really feel like using all my gas money to go to a track meet or to a ball game or to a chorus concert. I, man, I just want to go. It takes sacrifice to make those relationships to make disciples. Galatians 5.24 says, Disciples have nailed their passions and their desires to the cross and crucified them there. you got to take your, will, your wants. I'd rather sit at home and watch Netflix. I know, but nail that to the cross. Well, I, I really, it, it's an awkward to have a conversation. God has led me uh, to have an affection for people that normally I can't stand. I'm like, y'all bother me. Stop talking. Why does God make me want to love you? I don't understand. It takes sacrifice, even of your comfort, to really make disciples. But the third fact, this is most frustrating to me, is that you don't always see the results. As a youth pastor, this is doubly true. Because I'm planting these seeds. I'm, I'm giving them good advice. I'm trying to teach them the Bible. And I don't know, listen, I love y'all, but y'all can be dumb sometimes. I'm like, why do you have to make all these mistakes yourself? Let me tell you, don't do it that way. I don't always get to see the results of that. And I remember one time I was, I was uh, boo-hooing to, to Don Shankle. We were talking about that. And, and he, was, he encouraged me with uh, John 4, 37 and 38. He says, you know the saying, one plants and another harvest. And it's true. I sent you to the harvest where you didn't plant, and others have already done the work. And now you will get to gather the harvest. Unfortunately, there's going to be, well, not unfortunately, maybe unfortunately for me and, and my desire, but there's going to be other people that harvest the change, the life change that I'm planting right now, right? But we have to realize we're just a part of the process. It says, another part of the Bible says, hey, listen, one person plants, another person waters, another person, you know, tills the dirt, and God, but God is the one that makes that happen. God's the one that grows. And we can even make something like disciple making selfish if we think, God, you got to do this on my time. God, you have to let me see the results. And, and we're going to have to realize that we don't always get the payoff. That, you know, Don was telling me that all the things that, that people in his life had told him when he was 15, 16, 17, 20, and he has no clue where they are now. They don't get to see the guy that's an elder and a deacon and a, and a church planner. But that's what happened. God watered it, and, and now other people get to take advantage of that. So uh, what we have to realize that, that you don't always see the results. But there's one more thing that I... Uh, we, we can't forget when it comes to making disciples, and that's making disciples, it requires heavenly help. It requires heavenly help, and wouldn't you know it, God comes through. Look at verse 20. He says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of an age, right? God sets before us this impossible task. You got to make disciples, you have to take these annoying, dirty, uh, aggravating people that are doing everything in their power to work against me that are my enemies, and I want you to push them towards me. And it's impossible without God. I, I, let me just make sure that you know that it is impossible without God. In fact, um, he, he set it up that way. Um, Colossians 1.29 says, uh, I work and struggle so hard depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. It's a struggle you're going to have to put work into it, but we're not, this is not just an equation we get to and, put and, and apply to other, uh, every situation. God has to be a part of this process. God has to uh, work, go before you. And may, hopefully, you're already thinking of somebody that, that God's telling you to disciple. The, they're like, yeah, you need to make them a disciple. You know what you can do? Drop everything and start praying for them right now. 
Say, God, help me. I, help me know what to say. By the way, you know faith is a gift, right? You can't make someone have faith in God. So you've got to pray that God will give them the gift of faith so that you can, and then give God give me the words to say so that I can make a disciple out of them. We can't remove God from the situation. And much like the rest of the Christian life, God designed disciple making to be impossible without him. It's impossible. But you know what? This is kind of what I thought. I'm not ready. Kind of like Aaron was saying, I'm not ready for this. I don't know the language. I don't have a Bible uh, education. I'm not, I can't make a, a disciple. Here's the thing. When you go and make disciples, you're made a disciple. You're discipled in the process. I can't take, tell you how many times, sorry to blow teenagers your, your view of me, but there's times y'all text me and go, Ben, I need help with this. And I've realized, crap, I didn't pray today so far. Man, I've been neglecting my Bible study. And, and so when they reach out to me and say, help me with this, it forces me to my knees to pray. It forces me to go to the Word and try to figure that out for them. Just the, the act of going will bring us closer to God. Like iron sharpening iron, when we disciple each other, when we make each other disciples, it, it's, it's a win-win. It's beneficial for, for everybody. Um, and it's the best thing you can do. The truth is, when you invest in people, disciple-making, you invest in eternity, right? Both your eternity and their eternity. I think that for the first part of, of heaven, uh, I'm just going to be thanking the people that have discipled me. They're probably going to get tired of hearing it because we're going to have some time on our hands. So I'm like, thank you. You told me that four billion times. I know, but thank you. Appreciate that. Right? When you invest in somebody, when you go without, when you sacrifice some of your time and your money, you're investing in eternity. You're stacking up those blessings for yourself, and you're blessing somebody else's eternity as well. And remember, uh, if y'all were here last week, Randy had an illustration about how long eternity is. Yeah, maybe you want to invest in that and go without here for a little bit. But there's a couple of you, probably more than, than I would know, that, that are probably going, you know, I just, still just don't care, Ben. Like, you're, you're, talking to me, you're talking to me like I'm a Christian. You're talking to me like, like I'm invested and I love Jesus, and, and I'm just not there yet. I don't understand. This is, I'm doing good to stay awake, right? And I, w- I, w- I want to I w- I w- I put this before you. I know I don't I may not know all of you, but I know this. We all want to live a life of significance. We all want to live a life with meaning. We all want to live a life that matters, to have a reason to roll out of bed and do what we do every day. And even if you're not a Christian uh, attending church, you probably want that. You probably want your life to count. Well, there's nothing better that you can do to have a a legacy, to have something that that you do that lasts forever than making a disciple, of multiplying out what God has done in your heart and giving that to other people. That's the way to do it. And so here's the thing, though. Only disciples make disciples. If you're not a disciple yourself, then there's no use. And so I want to make sure that you're a disciple this morning. So would you bow your head and close your eyes? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just want to give you a chance to get alone with God and Consider a couple things with me. You see, a lot of this doesn't really matter if you don't at first get there with God yourself. We're getting ahead of the game if you think you're going to lead someone to Jesus and, and you're not even there yourself. And you've heard the gospel this morning. You've heard that Jesus died. There was a reason he died because you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We are imperfect, and inside of a, of a perfect God, we needed something to make it right. And so, Jesus died on a cross for us. And then, because he's not just another human being, he came back. God brought him back from the dead so that we could have eternal life. So that God could show us that it doesn't matter uh, about the death that, that, uh, that, that so easily uh, tempts us to be fearful, uh, things like 9-11 and thing, all these other tragedies that go on in the world, God already has victory over that. And it's available to you now. 
But there has to be that time where you've said, you know what, I need Jesus. I can't do it on my own. You've got to believe that Jesus is the only way, that you can't get a self-help book, you, 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 you can't rely on the Muslim faith or the Buddhist faith, but that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, died for you and made a payment for your sins so that you can spend all eternity with your Creator. And it's so important. Even more important than making disciples is that you become one. And so if you want to do that this morning, if there's never been that, that time, that moment where, where you've done that, well, we want to be a part of that. We want to help encourage that in your life. Because you can show up to church, you can, you can have all the right answers, and then we're going to get there one day, and there's going to be some that, that hear God say, get away from me, I never knew you. You knew all the right answers, but you didn't know me. And so if you want to get to know God right now, this is what I need you to do. We're just going to say a prayer. And it's not a magic prayer. You don't have to say it a certain way. But, but people all around are going to be praying this out loud to encourage you to call on the name of the Lord so that you can be saved. So if you would, uh, just pray this prayer with me. If that's where you're feeling, if that's what you mean, then say, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord, and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. If you said that prayer, and you meant it, if that's the, the cry of your heart this morning, uh, then even though there was no thunderclap, even though the earth didn't shake, there was a miracle that happened. You became a disciple of Jesus. And now you have the power to remain faithful. You have the power to have victory over death. And so let me pray for you. Dear Jesus, I just thank you. Lord, I don't know if anyone said that prayer this morning. But Lord, I just encourage uh, anybody that did. Uh, God, I just ask that you protect them. That you would encourage them. That you would let them know that it's real. That it's not just something that they recited because everybody else was, was doing it. But that, that, that this was a real thing. That they can, they can bet that their eternity is secure with you. Lord, protect them, help them to find somebody to talk to about it. Lord, uh, open up a door for them to, uh, to talk more about that. And Lord, bring them someone to make a disciple out of them. Bring in somebody that can, can help them along and push them closer to you. God, may they not stay the same uh, as they are today. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.